All right. <clears throat> Sounds good. All right. So, Bruce, uh, we are very interested in hearing about your personal experiences with active worlds. I'm curious about all sorts of ways that you were involved in early virtual worlds, including things like the contact consortium. Um, and we're also interested in kind of getting a tour of uh, various spaces in active worlds that are of particular interest uh, to you and to the history of early virtual worlds. Um, I know that you had that teleport list. Those looked like a really solid list of destinations to see. So um, I'll kind of uh, let you decide, you know, the, the order that makes sense to you in terms of presenting um, active worlds. Sorry, I'm just laughing because Mitchell's sinking through the floor here. <laughs> oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention, which is um, uh, don't mind me if my avatar is like flying all over and like doing weird things. I'm just uh, the camera, my, uh, camera guy. So I'm just trying to get, uh, you know, lining up the shots and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. Don't mind me. <laughs> Well, maybe, um, may, maybe I'll give a, a, a little introduction to me by way of introduction. Yeah, that sounds perfect. So uh, my name is Dr. Bruce Damer. I am uh, currently a, a scientist with University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, But back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was enthralled by the possibility of virtual worlds uh, coming into existence. And I was living in Prague. And in 1991 or 92, I read Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson's great novel in which he introduces the term metaverse. And I thought, wow, this has to exist sometime. This has to happen. The World Wide Web hadn't been invented yet. And one day I was out drinking brown beer in the park with a friend who described what it seemed like a virtual world. And it, was a, it would turn out to be a mud, a text-based mud. And I didn't know anything about that. I, I assumed what he was describing, which was the SolSys virtual space station and planets and whatnot where student teams would meet. And it was a pedagogical platform. And I thought, wow, this is a virtual world. And when I found out about it a little more and I actually met the founder of SolSys, it turns out to have been a text-based environment, kind of like the original adventure game or a little bit way, the way that Dungeons and Dragons happened on paper in the 70s. My brother used to play that. You know, you enter a room and there are four exits from the room and there's an object in the room. It's all, all language based. And I thought, wow, well, this here's an example of a MUD working over TCP IP, over Ethernet, connecting schools in Arizona and on Indian Reservation, the Navajo Reservation, and they're living in this environment of a solar system, uh, but it's all text. And so out of this original core group, which was called Contact, we formed a new initiative called the Contact Consortium, which would take all these people who had this online experience and apply them to the coming of metaverses, of graphical representations of people and landscapes. Uh, i.e. avatars per, per Neil Stevenson. And we were in the midst of forming the organization and we were having meetings in the spring of 1995 and the first environment appeared online, which is called World's Chat in May of 1995. And then in August of 1995, the same company, which was named Worlds Incorporated, launched Alpha World. And I was uh, uh, one of the earliest users and I realized Alpha World has it. Alpha World, it, it was just a green plane with a few objects, but you could clone the objects. You could pick them up, make a copy of them, rotate them, raise and lower them, and then stack them, and you could build stuff. It was that simple. And at the same time, there was a project called Virtual Reality Modeling Language, an initiative that had been started by Tony Parisi, Mark Pesci, and, and a whole group. Their approach was to run a tool that would then allow you to wireframe and build build worlds. And I thought, wow, this is an interesting contrast. You have world builders who require you to, to run a complex tool to, to texture and light your entire scene, and then you share it with someone, uh, and maybe it's a multi-user world, versus you start with a blank slate and allow the users to go in 
and with a set of objects, and they could even make their own objects, build it like Lego or like what we see today in Minecraft. And Alpha World just exploded. Um, it was, you know, only a few thousand users by the end of 1995, but they took a satellite image, which I sent to you guys, of the, the Alpha World population of objects that have been placed down. And you can make out rivers and towns and all kinds of things. Hundreds of thousands or millions of objects have been placed down uh, building little homesteads. And the users just poured in through the central park. And you could watch the morphology of this world change, like when they introduced teleports, that you could one object would take you from a position to another coordinate and zoom you, zoom you around. And suddenly when teleports had come, there was an explosion of building along axes where it was easy to remember, oh, I'm at 2,000 north and zero. And so those became prime real estate, those numbers, and filled up quickly. And there was an incredible dynamism to it versus the environments where content creators were making experiential, like location-based entertainment environments that then you went and experienced as a user, and there was a sort of separation. And about the same time, the Burning Man Festival was starting in the desert, and it was very much like Alpha World in that people arrived, they picked their plot out of a, out of a chart, they used the World Wide Web to coordinate, and camps just appeared everywhere. Camps would appear around the central part called the Esplanade, they were more like experiential camps, but it was done distributed, peer-to-peer, -peer, completely emergent phenomenon. And so that's the fascination of when the Contact Consortium, we picked Active Worlds, which was, was the original Alpha World, as in our, our experimental platform and worked with a developer to create things like the Telegram interface or an easy way to right-click on a username and join them in a, in a world. And they gave, gave us worlds to do experiments with. And one of them, which we're going to take you to, uh, was called uh, Avatars 98 Inside Cyberspace. It's called AV98. And prior to this, uh, and I can take you to this other earlier place, we did our first community build. Like we said to ourselves, what if you gave building rights to a group of people, not just have one person dragging objects around a building, but 10 people that each would build part of a world? And that was Sherwood Forest Town, which I started laying out in January of 96 and by basically placing a whole bunch of trees in an area to, to reserve it. Uh, because if you put an object down, it became your territory. And then people came into Sherwood Forest and we removed the trees and then they started building their stuff by hand. And if you're interested, guys, I can we can teleport over to to Sherwood Forest, just as a, a preliminary, uh, before we go to Avatars 98. That sounds fantastic. Okay, hold on. So let, let's see if you can join me. I'm, it's at Sherwood Forest, is, the entrance is at 105 North, 189 East in, in Alpha World. Now if I click there, I just go there. I've turned all my sound effects off so that it doesn't get into the audio, by the way, but you might. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to accept you to join me. There you are. I'm going to back. Right, let me get my tabs back up here and see if I can teleport to you. And if you, if Zatomica turns around, if you back up a bit, you'll see the front gate and use the page up key, you can look up. There's been a little vandalism to our site because uh, there were little cracks, little cracks of, there's, oh, there's Derek. So if you turn yourself around and look, page up, looks up, and page down, looks down. This is the front gate, and there were these newsstands where if you clicked, you could get Sherwood Forest uh, news. And if you actually click on one of these Sherwood Town websites, newsstand, you'll get a web pop-up that shows you the news for the town in very 1990s hand-built website style. 
and things like we had a mixer on July 13th and there's screenshots of of people uh, in the party and what we learned in our July 13th 1996 mixer so there's there's the news a news stand for for Sherwood and I want to walk in through this stone arch here and you'll you'll see there's this sort of a blue I'm gonna hit if you hit the end key you go out of body bird's eye view home key gets you into first person view so I've I've hit my end key and I'm gonna go into this blue dot and what we decided was was there had to be an easy way to get people together in world and we coined the term in world this was all being invented like what is your experience? Well, I'm in world. I'm with people inside a virtual world. And so we arranged these pots in a circle and people stood at each pot. Like they could, you know, Derek, you could stand at a pot. There could be a dozen people or two dozen people standing in here so that their text was separated. So if I type something, if I type hello, my text is above my head and I can be in bird's eye view and I can watch the text above multiple people's heads as, as well as down in the uh, in the chat. There was no chat actually initially. So it's only text above the avatar head. So this is the first talking circle. So I think of this as kind of a historical archaeological site. So when you come in the gate, you're in the talking circle. And if we move forward, so it was like trying to create user interface innovations uh, to make the community work. So here are some of the trees that we put down. And if I right click actually on a tree, it's gonna tell me the date. Sometimes it tells you the date the object was put there. And it's, yeah, uh, Tuesday, February 13th, 1996. That tree was put there. So talk about ancient stuff. Oh, I see uh, Derek or Zatonica is right up in front of me. So all of these objects are super old. They're like, you know, a, an old archaeological ruin in a way. So now I'm walking forward towards this building, going in the door. I'm going to go into first person view. And you can see it. things are, are pretty simple. Uh, this is sort of the old schoolhouse. Uh, has a fireplace in it, but then out the door there was some of the first animations as a waterfall. Uh, if you hit the shift key, by the way, you'll pass through objects when you're moving. So there was a waterfall, and I'm walking along to the right through more of this forest. You know the for and if you hit the control key, you go faster. So control shift, you sort of plow through things. And this is Laurel's Herb Garden. So now I'm in Laurel's house. And, and that was one of the people in Sherwood Project. So she wanted to make like a garden setting house. And luckily we did cover up most of the land so we didn't get vandalized. Other people found cracks and, and put stuff in the cracks. So this is Sherwood Forest. And I'm going to zoom up. If you hit the plus key, uh, you can zoom up. And there's all this crap around Sherwood Forest, but there is a sort of peaceful environment inside the walls. There's a barn there. I'm looking down at a barn. I don't know if you guys are able to capture this on video, but I floated yes. up with the plus key. So you already so got you here. Yep. Yep. There we go. And there's kind of a mess down there where stuff was inserted. But this this is the original boundary with all those archways of Sherwood Forest Town. And so it was experiment number one. Can we can we handle a group of people with common privileges building a common place? And this is, you know, in March, in, in, you know, we had Community Day on March 24th, 1996. And we showed this live at the contact conference, our original parent organization, so they could see that this is actually happening. And part of contact included science fiction writers like Jerry Purnell and Larry Niven and others. 
because such a this is all inspired by science fiction in a way. So these science fiction writers were there and and witnessing the birth of a kind of new cyberspace that wasn't just an interface. It wasn't just a worldwide web and buttons. It was a place. I called it cyberspace with a human face. So we were off and running. We could do experiments inside a virtual world platform, and several more were launched in 95, 96, and we can talk about them uh, in, in another episode. But we, if we focus on active worlds, uh, we'll, we'll learn a lot. So, oh, there's Highwayman um, saying uh, Digi was responsible for those worlds. I'm going to say, I'm going to actually text Highwayman. I'm going to message him and say we're going to meet us in AV98. See if he'll meet us. Sounds Sending good. a telegram. Meet us in AV98. So how many people were involved in this particular uh, little village experiment? Probably about a dozen people from an ethnographer to... Uh, an anthropologist to tech people, young people, old people, artists. Just seeing what we could do. We we even had a trickster person that was assigned. It was an unknown person that would come and move stuff around. And he wrote a, a, a piece of graffiti saying Coyote was here. And we did that as an experiment so that when other members came in, they saw what they thought of as sort of vandalism or a trickster element. That's great. It's very fascinating to see all of this vandalism around the corners on the edges of this. So you mentioned the archways were sort of the boundary. It looks like mostly within the boundaries it was untouched, but outside of the boundaries, people have built up all surrounding. Yeah, and and uh, I don't know if it's because Sherwood was kind of famous. I mean, Sherwood won an award at the Ars Electronica Festival in Austria. Uh, or something, um, but you know it's written about in a lot of articles and stuff. So perhaps people visited and wanted to leave an artifact there. Yeah. But um, so we realized that as a community we could build a common thing and have it coherence and have a, have a life to it, like have meetings, have a poetry reading in it. We did a po with a live poet on a stage. There's a stage there. And then, so we did multiple experiments after that, but at that time in 1996, we were going to host our first conference. So we held a, a small workshop in the beginning of 96, and then I just pushed the button and committed to a full-size two-day conference in San Francisco. 500 people showed up in a big hotel, and it was all the virtual world platforms. It was all the companies building them, users, people studying them, creatives, historic people like Lauren Carpenter, who founded Pixar, was there. Sandy Stone, uh, quite a famous academic, was there. There were all kinds of people. In fact, at the second meeting, we had our future governor, Jerry Brown, was there. Um, I, sent, I met Neil Stevenson later and described what we had done because we kind of had realized his metaverse. But so we held the conference in San Francisco, and then we held a second conference in 1997 at, at uh, a university in San Francisco. And I realized it is expensive. I mean, we needed $200,000 of funds and a huge amount of logistics, and 500 people would come. And the second conference, we had a major power outage in San Francisco, which kind of blew us up. Oh, yeah. So we then decided uh, in 98 to put our money where our mouth is uh, or, you know, to take our own drugs in a sort of sense and move the entire event inside cyberspace. So let's go to AV98 and High Women's already there. So I'm going to join. You guys can join me or find it in this, the list of worlds. Sounds good. There's High Women. I'll say hi. Except Set. 
All right, I'm going to double check uh, everything on this side. Yeah, we're still recording on Audacity. Wow, look at your avatar. That's great. Yeah, so I'm wearing my conference chair avatar. And Avatars 98 had dozens of innovations that were done on a shoestring budget with tech that was barely there. And But we did a lot of social design. And this is something I think is not yet present in the modern VR virtual world landscape as much as, as perhaps it was here. You guys could correct me. But the social design, one of the elements was DigiGardener, his avatar should be like 12 feet tall. So he has some authority. So if I'm going and there's somebody who's uh, cussing off a speaker or offending an exhibitor, I can go and kind of read the law to them. So they made my avatar this big, this kind of robot with my picture on it. So that was kind of one of the social aspects. But where you're standing, uh, if, you, if you rotate yourself around, I'm kind of at eye level turning around. You'll see it's a uh, looks like a big building, and it's actually modeled on Heathrow Terminal 4 in Heathrow Airport in London. So the roof is the model of that. Stuart Gold is the architect who was the designer behind a lot of this. And a team of volunteers made all these objects. And we're in this sort of central area. And you can see there's Avatars 98 at the DigiGarden. That was our live webcam from here at Ancient Oaks Farm in October of, uh, this is November of 1998. When we, when we did this, we went live. And everyone was on modem connections. So this world was streaming over 24K, 96K K modems, but doing just fine, loading just fine, because basically the world is a set of, of, of points that attach to an object which you already have in your cache. So you could walk through and the world just sort of assembles in front of you. And if you'll remember in Snow Crash, uh, the original Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson described avatars going black and white or becoming sprites if they were uh, if there was too much rendering happening. And that actually was sort of implemented in in Alpha World. So if I rotate around, it's, there's a sign saying 1998 Avi Award winner summer. And by my two keys in Natropolis. And that's the winner of the avatar of the year. And there was a competition as there was at the physical meetings. And we'll go to the Avi Award area later. If I look in the front, it, there's a big banner that says Contact Consortium welcomes you to Avatars 98. That's the entry to the exhibit area. If I keep rotating around to my left, I can see two art galleries and Avi Awards. And then behind me, there's an information board, which is called the big board and uh we'll go we'll go to all these places i'm going to say highway we are touring he, he's an old old user oh do you know him from back in the day i believe so he might know me recording on a mic so he can't hear what we're doing i would normally be giving him a play-by-play so I'm going to rotate around and I'm going to let's let's go to the exhibit area first. So as I walk forward, there are these flashing arrows and those are called warps. And this is another innovation in in active worlds. And they, that will warp you over to the location quickly. But there's other little flashing things called conference directory. If I click on those, if I click on one of those, it brings up the entire uh, clickable conference map. If I click on the exhibit hall, it takes me right to the entrance to the exhibit hall. And then if I click below on exhibitors directory, there are all these companies and universities and a, and a map of the exhibit hall in the 2D web. So let's see, uh, if I find I want to go to Boeing, I can click literally the direct teleport and I'm in the Boeing company and this is Rick Wojcik 
who was at Boeing and part of our contact consortium studying studying how these worlds were emerging. And there's another one called Exponet, which has a little bit more content still remaining. I'm going to click on that. Expoworld.net. John Pasqua. I, I haven't spoken these words in 20, these names in 20 years. So his what he did, and this is this is a really important point for for everyone and for the listeners, these booths were laid out with a web form. What we realized is that uh, if you had users having to learn a 3D tool, do design their booth and wireframe it up and then submit it as an experience that people would teleport into, very few people would want to do that. It, in a sense, 3D modeling tools are the killer app and that they kill access to virtual worlds. If you're requiring them, you want to build your own world here, her take 3D Studio Max or take some simple web tool and build your world, good luck. You know, you're going to get very little content. And I think that's been borne out. But what if you said, it's like Burning Man. You can pick your camp location on a, on a website it's your spot, and then you can lay it out with standard parts. You could pick this pillar and put your image of your company, you know, expoworld.net, and pick a couple of objects like a web link there. So none of this works anymore. And then URLs to all your resources, and boom, when you arrive in the exhibit hall, your booth is built for you. So it was the idea of democratizing the ability of users to make 3D content quickly and easily. And we did the same thing with the art gallery, and I'll take you there in a bit. But if we walk through this exhibit hall, we had Orange County Convention Center, which was a real convention center, and they were studying this as though uh, this might be the future for conventions, so they better get to know it. Oh, the Idea Factory, look at this. I'm at the Idea Factory. This is a group in Singapore, John Kao, and some of their artwork is still up. It's amazing. 26, 24, five years later, if I click on uh, Weblink, I wonder if it gets to their website. No, it's gone. That's his book, Jamming, from the 90s. So that's the exhibit hall. And if I float up and I look down, you can kind of see it's there's a, quite a few booths there. And people were there in person manning or womaning the booths just to uh, meet people that would be walking through. And what we did is a lot of social design. So at one point we would have a bot that would text out in bold, there's something happening in the exhibit hall, warp over there, join the bot and go there and we get a flash mob, a crowd that would appear. So if you have if you have uh, social design, you get engagement. So now what I'm going to do is take you over to an important part of Avatars 98, which is the big board. So I'm going to warp over there directly. You guys can warp along with me. So I forget what the, the big board is from, but it's I think it's from science fiction. And what it is, it's, it's a big floating board in a virtual world that, it, that shows all the events that are happening based on the time. So if I'm floating up, I see tracks, 1800 Greenwich Mean Time, 1900 Greenwich Mean Time, etc. And then the tracks are... The Art of Science and Community, Educators, World Design, and Virtual Workspace, Highwire, and VLearn Workshop. And these are all the, it's basically like having a conference book. And if I click on the little warp, the little uh, icon down there, I will get the big board schedule on the web, on the, you know, it just pops up in the web. And I can read about it. It's like my conference book, but I can float right up to to this uh, and click on the big board itself. And I'm going to click on a, a speaker pod. And now I've warped over to the speaker pod. 
So the big board takes you over to these pods. And I'll wait till you guys arrive here. I'm just uh, kind of going in into the pod. We're still recording. Everything's everything's fine here. Okay, everything's looking good so far. So what we what we learned was in, in this particular platform, we had to sound isolate everything. I.e., if if all of it was together, the text chat would kind of collide. If you were far enough apart inside this virtual conference hall, text chat was sort of not being seen or heard from the say the central area or the exhibit hall so these pods are little speaker areas that are populated again by by bots pulling from web websites that people said well i need to have my slides the presenters up front a couple of things a couple of logos an audio link that would allow uh, live audio to stream out through talkspace uh, which is way back. This is 1998. So you don't have, there's no YouTube or anything like that. There's no, none of that sort of stuff. And so this was a pod that was built just for that moment, it was built just as before the speakers arrived, it would assemble it, a speaker room, a breakout room. And then the talk would happen. It would be recorded potentially. And then the room would be broken down. And the next one put up. So you can have these this kind of dynamism that sort of a big bot in the sky was was running all of the six or seven parallel breakout rooms that were were operating. So but they were isolated from each other. So is that does that make sense how how we did that? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty neat. That's quite innovative for the time. Um with this conference in general, would was this the first like pretty much all online conference in a 3D space? This was, uh, and uh, to give you the idea of, you know, we didn't know uh, what the numbers would be because the platforms were less than two years old and the maturity, we didn't know uh, whether we could handle it, but it turns out that this world, this single AB98 world all dialed in through modem connection we peaked out at maybe 850 simultaneous users in this space in November 1998. So it was very large. The, the number of users was very large. The developer of the world, Ron Britvich, sat on the server and just monitored it and said it went to big, the biggest numbers he'd ever seen, but it was totally stable. And the content was totally stable streaming out. So it was, okay. yeah, it was it was great. And let's, uh, I'm going to zoom over to the art gallery now. We're, I'm warping to the art gallery. And the art gallery was a little bit like the exhibit hall, but you hung your art. So instead of an exhibit about your company or your research group at a university, uh, this was for people to put their artwork up just as you see at a conference and as was done at the contact conference since 1982. So the contact consortium, and we're looking at Nancy Zydema's art. She was an early member of the contact consortium, which is a, a nonprofit organization. Still exists today, but in another form. All the other artwork is sort of offline because it's URLs directly to JPEGs or GIFs or something. That on sites that are gone, uh, but Nancy's site's still live. So there's her artwork served after all these years. And I'm gonna zip over to uh, another fun area, the, the webcam wall. And what we decided to do is sort of bring a bit of the real world into the virtual by saying, hey, you can, their webcams were a new thing, and they generally produce an image every few seconds. And we decided to put a wall of them up and build scripts that would go and pull these cam images from all over the net. And this was completely populated with views from all over the world. And if I'm uh, scrolling, I'll actually stand next to 
to the uh, there's a, there you are as Atomicas. I'm standing next to our our cam that we had, and there's still like the last image when we were shutting down is still there. Digi's place, Digi Gardner's place. That's in the old farmhouse here at Ancient Oaks Farm. That's me and my hippie, more hippiness, uh, twenty some years ago, and several people who were at our node. And Avatars 98 had nodes all over the world. It had individuals dialing in from their computers, but also a, a the e Electronic Cafe in Santa Monica, an art museum in in uh, Helsinki, Finland, had it on a huge screen, and there were like 200 people there. So there were these nodes all over the planet, uh, and the you know several thousand users. And one of the users was an interesting character named Michael Nesmith. Uh, who, who you might recognize the name. He was uh, the lead singer of the Monkees. The Monkees, yeah. And and so he was running around. He lived just down the road in Monterey, and he was running around in Nez, and and he got the idea from all this to create virtual bands mm -hmm. uh, and went on to build his own studio. But there were well-known scientists in here, uh, political people, anthropologists, um, and also CNN. So if you look over here, this CNN live feed on to your right here, CNN actually did a, a live broadcast from Avatars 98 because it was the same time as the Comdex Computer Festival, uh, computer exhibit, um, a conference, what am I saying, in Las Vegas was 20 conference halls. And they did a CNN FN financial news network coverage of Avatars 98 as, well, maybe this is going to be the way we meet in the future rather than going to Vegas and, you know, dropping a ton of cash in a casino. So that's, so when, when we were, when CNN went live with a broadcast about Avatars 98, we watched it in webcam kind of occasional screenshots in the world. So we had 200 people standing here in Avatar watching themselves being shown on net, on broadcast TV. And that was kind of a first as well. That was later kind of replicated with MTV and On Live Traveler. But that that was that was pretty thrilling. So we're going to now go to uh, a next location, teleport to other worlds. And then we're going to wrap it up in Avatars 98. So I'm now in an area called Teleport to Other Worlds. And what you're seeing here are images of other technologies, other virtual world platforms, because Alpha World and Active World wasn't the only platform. Uh, there was a platform right here called Traveler, which I actually bought after the company went bankrupt in 2000. Traveler. Uh, was going away and it was on the cover of my book avatars and I, I so i bought the entire asset out of the bankruptcy and traveler as you can see right behind me here uh, is a voice world with avatars that do lip syncing and there's 3d spatialized voice just a tremendous technology and in fact there's a team right now you guys are on that thread to to get a uh, traveler back and running traveler for me was the when I did, I did hundreds of talks on virtual worlds, I would open with Traveler because people could completely relate to it. Here's a clown and a seahorse moving around with lip syncing and real voices are coming out, floating in a spatialized, like cocktail party, spatialized audio. So Traveler, people could grok it. That's what an avatar is. Those are people, they built this place. And so Traveler is gonna come back alive for the 2020s due to some really good work that's been done to get it working on modern platforms. So if I look around, I'll see Outer Worlds, there's Black Sun Interactive, which was based on a version of VRML, uh, named after the famous Black Sun Cafe in Snow Crash. There's Worlds Away. If you see Worlds Away Club Connect, that was run on CompuServe. And that was an event held in parallel. So each of these platforms held Avatars 98 events. 
at the same time as the event that was in in active worlds. The interesting story behind Worlds Away, it's the successor to Habitat, which was the first avatar environment designed by Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar, built by them in 1998 for Lucasfilm. And you can see video of the original Club Carib and Worlds Away, uh, original Habitat online from dial-up days uh, that was offered through CompuServe in the 90s. And so that's Worlds Away. There's VNet, which was a Java-based Moo that joined the event. And there's the Palace, uh, which was quite a big platform. It was 2D artwork with chat and a lot of features. Uh, Roomancer was a new platform. So this is teleports. So if you clicked on these things, it told you how to get to the clients. There was no compatibility between these worlds. So you couldn't take your avatar to Worlds Away and then go on into Black Sun. The content's incompatible. Everything is custom, just as we have today. So there is no universal metaverse. And as you know, Facebook takes on the moniker and the challenge of creating a, a true metaverse, which I, I doubt if anyone can at this point, um, they'd have to create universal standards. Uh, which I just don't see happening. We we had, at our 1996 physical conference, we had a special half day on standards, avatar standards, and world standards to allow you to walk. You know, could this ever happen? Could you walk through worlds and, and be uh, able to uh, visit multiple worlds from multiple technologies? Uh, we're going to finish up at the AVI Awards I'm just zooming over there, warping over there, and then we'll finish our tour of Avatars 98. And it's been so much fun to actually go around these spaces I haven't been in for a decade. I'm, I'm, yeah. very, I'm grateful to the Active Worlds company for keeping these worlds alive and online all this time. Absolutely. Why do you suppose that they are still online? You know, I think the the two uh, individuals who, who purchased this technology, there was a a period in which Worlds Incorporated was going into its form of bankruptcy, uh, as all early companies do. Uh, they're pioneering companies. They run out of investment dollars. And they so these were two users that purchased the technology back in, gosh, I guess it was 90, 98 time frame. And they just kept it going and they used the platform to develop business projects and whatnot, and they're still doing it. I mean, the company was based in Newburyport, uh, Connecticut, no, Newburyport, Maine, I believe. Massachusetts, I think. Or Massachusetts, okay, right. And um, they're still around. I actually haven't, I got in touch with one of the guys at the company just to get my username all redone. Mm-hmm. And they're still around, so okay. it, it's just amazing that this stuff is running still. Do you think that they're making any real money, or is it kind of out of love, or both? They were definitely making money. So, as virtual worlds sort of waned and waxed, and and then ebbed and flowed, and the tides came in and went out, they would be able to quickly build content for people. Um, so I think that. With modest, you know, a modest projects, they could keep the thing going. I think Rick, uh, Rick Knoll said, as long as I can keep having a chicken in the oven for my family, I'll, I'm fine. Something like that. Um, so it, it keeps going, whereas all the other platforms we've seen, the Traveler, um, Traveler we're trying to restore, uh, Habitat has been restored by Chip and Randy through a wonderful project to get Habitat back up. Um, the palace, I think, uh, went somewhere else. I'm not sure if it's online, but these these platforms do die off, and then the users and all their experiences uh, go with them. And that's, I guess, one of the themes of pre- preserving worlds uh, that you guys are pursuing. That's right. Yeah, and. You know, maybe we're getting a little afield from this particular part of this uh, conference, but I think this is a useful sort of rabbit hole to side side way to go here. Um, 
I'm curious your thoughts about like why some platforms survive and some don't. Um, I know there are a number of different ways that these things can go. You know, sometimes the creators can just release them as open source. Sometimes fans run servers. Sometimes, uh, like in this case, fans buy them. But do you think, I'm just kind of curious your general thoughts, like what aspects of these platforms allow them to survive or how, how do you see them surviving? I think that if, if they're solely, if the content and the care of the servers is solely in the company's hands, it's less likely to survive. Whereas if users are running servers on a distributed basis and doing their own content, it's got more potential. If the company goes away that owns the technology, they can probably keep their servers running. So it's like if they're if it's peer to peer rather than being centralized. That makes sense. And and so for example, a platform like Second Life is uh, at risk because it is central uh, content. Um, and and it's not true. It's not a sort of true internet platform. It's not distributed fully. Um, so you you have that risk of all that content going away if it's centrally run. But on the other hand, they can guarantee types of service and experience that a distributed platform might not be able to. Yeah, that makes sense. By the way, the we're standing in the Avi Awards area, and if I go, we'll just finish our little tour here. You see 1996 and 97, I think you might be able to click there. You can click on 1996 AVI Awards and 1997 AVI Awards, and you'll actually see winners of the avatar designs for those years, the pr previous years that there were physical conferences where we had a huge Halloween party and you came dressed as your favorite avatar, uh, a lot of fun. And these were the winners for those years. But if I back up, I can see that uh, we've got the, the win winners of the all virtual Avi uh, Wars was Summer, who was a almost naked female avatar with animated butterflies for clothing. Uh, and then the category winners on the on the right uh, for Av 98 uh, was the Avi Awards, the grand prize winner, and then the category winners. So it's our version of sort of the Oscars. But um, so what we had, and, and you can see images of this online of basically five, 600 users standing in this spot as the winners were, were announced. Actually, I've got the picture up right now. There's a picture of all the users uh, floating and standing in this place, kind of like Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. You can, you can send, see those later. They're, they're all on the, on the website. Uh, and it was actually 600 people waiting to see who was voted the best avatar uh, of, of 1998, sort of finishing the event. The total runtime of the event was about 20 hours. So I was up very early in the morning and we had bots to announce things at certain times. We had people to kick other people out. We had sort of social norms. Most people were very well behaved, but people described the event later as being kind of like a trip. Uh, they were totally immersed for hours and hours on end because there was always something to do. They were always being prompted with something, go over here and this this person talking and there's an award and there's some art and there's you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort of a lesson for modern VR or virtual world platforms that I found when I put on my first Oculus and, you know, I tried all these platforms, even in the last two years, I don't think they've got the social thing. Like it's, it's really, it's all about the people and it's all about being greeted and having meaningful interactions and having meaningful things to do. And it's a lot of work. You can't just sort of put content out with random users entering at random times. You have to create events, happenings, they'd be called in the 60s. They're pretty well designed and, and structured. And then you can leave people with the sense they've been somewhere and done something, that they really, they were lost in the world for hours on end. And so the lessons of Avatars 98 and the subsequent, we did 
four or five subsequent versions of this using different designs, uh, which you know we can we can pop into if you like. But we designed different spaces that went beyond the conference hall metaphor and gave people different and richer experiences in a different way from a floating Stanley Kubrick space station to uh, going to Jupiter, uh, going through the, the 2001 Space Odyssey to going to Hobbiton and Orthanc and in Middle Earth, that was in 2003, give them you know, theme-based places where they already know kind of the layout, they know what to expect, and then give them incredible surprises at the end. <coughs> so, uh, the, in a sense, I'm not sure, and I could be completely wrong, but the, the, the innovation of Avatars 98, I don't think has been fully duplicated uh, in an event space in modern VR or virtual worlds. And these are user-built social worlds, not game platforms. You know, game platforms are highly structured with contents and tournaments and everything like that. But the open user creative virtual world space, uh, <coughs> I'm not sure if it has, it, it, it has kind of repeated this structure, which really surprises me to no end that something like Avatars 98 or the subsequent Cyber conferences hasn't have not been done uh, since the '90s and early 2000s. Yeah, I haven't heard of anything like that happening anytime recently whatsoever. Come to think of it, very interesting. Um, so you mentioned that you have other conferences to show us, um, and before we actually figure out where we're moving next, I was curious to ask. Um, what were some of the big like uh, takeaways from this conference? Not in the sense of like the logistics of running it and the firsts and everything, but in terms of like insights or ideas that came out of like discussions held at this conference or interactions held at this conference. I saw there was a lot of academic uh, type of events here. Like, uh, what did people walk away from with this? You know, it people. I'm going to put the, the last shot in the text for uh, for Highwaymen to look at something. Uh, it it was it was a prototype. It was a learning experience uh, that then we replicated for several years. Um, I just assumed it would become kind of the norm, uh, and we the the challenge you have is in academia. Academia usually lags behind for several years. So we had academics here who eventually, some of them got tenured positions. And this was sort of an instrumental kind of in their thinking of virtual worlds for learning, for, for example. Uh, so that spread, but it took several years before those first articles came out and a chapter for uh, an MIT book and articles about this experience. Uh, so th that's a sort of slow, a slow kind of a, of a thing. Um, but what also happened was you had companies that were funded by investors. The dot-com crash happened in 2000, the dot-com bomb, they called it. And these companies just got vacuumed up. Uh, they either went full bankruptcy or they just vanished, uh, with the exception of a couple of them like, like Active Worlds. So a lot of that early experience was was lost, and it this and entered virtual worlds ended what some people call the winter period around 2000 to 2003 four. I wrote a bunch of articles in in that period, but I was starting to move out of virtual worlds towards space, toward working with NASA because NASA saw these 3D environments. Uh, we did a virtual walk on the moon with Rusty Schweikart, who was an, uh, an astronaut in the, on the Apollo 9 mission. And a university, the University of Cincinnati built this great reconstruction of spacecraft and a lunar surface. And Rusty sort of reenacted things uh, in the world. And that was actually also in, in, uh, <clears throat> in 98, uh, 99, actually, that, that happened. And so 
creative things happen, but then companies go away. Innovators, first generation innovators go away. And then there's this, this second coming. And the second coming included there.com. It included Adobe's Atmosphere platform, which I became kind of an evangelist for and worked with them to help development. And then Philip Rosedale formed or founded a Second Life. So I went up to Second Life in 2003 or so and gave a talk for the whole company. And I looked out in the audience and I said, how many of you were around in the initial work for the palace or Black Sun? Or And a whole bunch of hands went up. People had um, had worked in that first generation. So I, I gave a, a, a talk saying, this is what was learned. Um, and as you build uh, Second Life, consider the following properties that you should probably have in your platform, user affordances and the way things are done. And then Second Life exploded. You know, it, it, it was on the cover of magazines when we had magazines and it became sort of a, a moniker for it. And I asked, I remember asking Philip Rosedale, what are you going to call the names of the characters representing people? And he said, because uh, I said, could you call them avatars? And he said, oh, sure. Yeah. I said, thank you, because I wanted to try to maintain a through line between, you know, the avatars of Habitat in the 80s and Neil Stevenson's metaverse, and then the use of avatars in the late, in the 90s, and that Second Life also used the term avatars. So there was a, a, a lineage. But there were, there were technical mistakes made in Second Life's architecture. One of them was that if you had too many users in one space, it would clone it to not overload the server. So I forget what the limit was, but it meant you could never do a large event like this. Um, so, and I commented at the time, you need to be able to do mega events because it creates excitement and reason for platforms. Um, they were really focused on islands and the sale of server space. And they had centrally located all their content in, in one giant server farm because they wanted to guarantee physics. If I hit a ball here and it went between two areas that would behave the same. So it was a technical uh, argument, but users weren't hosting their own worlds and really building their own content. They were building it very much like active worlds, like alpha world, by moving parts around so that they got right. And Minecraft later got that really right. But they, they made some of these other uh, mistakes. I wouldn't really call them mistakes or business decisions. Uh, I went in to Second Life quite often. And I, we hosted NASA events there and all sorts of things in Second Life. Uh, and it was very compelling. I mean, the, the animation, even facial expressions came in. Uh, voice sort of came in, but it wasn't really built in as it had been done with Traveler, with lip syncing. Uh, but it was very compelling and a ton of great content was made and people had second lives. Uh, but then it started, it, it, it peaked I mean, about around 2010 or 12 or something, and then it sort of went off the bloom uh, for other platforms to rise. And then the whole trend of getting things easily accessible inside the web was also, you know, with applets. And then what about the mobile world that was coming in? And so I think second, virtual worlds had a second pulse in those years. Uh, and then they had a subsidence because Second Life wasn't acquired. You know, uh, Google tried to do a beta of a virtual world. Uh, but it kind of all sort of faded. The social virtual worlds faded again. Uh, and then VR was returning, you know, with Oculus and with all the other platforms and huge investment uh, that was going into VR. Also beautiful and impressive technology. I love the pass-through technology with AR. Um, you know, it mimics Rainbow's End, Werner Vinge's fantastic novel of AR. Uh, but it's you know it's ongoing and so when we see in 2022 or 2021 facebook renaming themselves meta and wanting to do a metaverse you know what are they trying to do you know do they have all the the background they need to create a truly social dynamic event filled 
big board informed, really interesting cyberspace that's social and packed with things to do and that's very dynamic, that's built in real time. Do they understand that? Do they understand doing the metaverse like Burning Man uh, or like Avatars 98? I don't know. I've, you know, I've not talked to Mark Zuckerberg or I haven't talked to anyone in years. You guys, you guys are the first people I've talked to in 10 or 12 years about this. So uh, perhaps this is providing some opportunity to communicate something from the deep past to the future. That's our hope. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little bit skeptical of this uh, Facebook metaverse myself. Um, do you uh, have a kind of, I don't know, what's your view? Like, do you, do you see potential with it or, or where do you think that's going? I, I don't know. I don't understand it. I mean, if it's just VR head mounted displays, if it's just that, it's not going to go much of anywhere. I mean, it, VR went into vertical applications a long time ago where it's very, very effective in gaming and in health and healing and psychology and in training and things like this. But it, it, it has so many uh, encumbrances on the user. It's competing with the mobile phone you pull out of your pocket and just look down at and you've done a hundred things already with a 2D interface. So there's in a sense a, a sense that 3D and immersive worlds are somehow more powerful informational interfaces and social interfaces, and they're not. I think that the jury is completely back on that. That 3D, while it can immerse you, like this event did for, for us and for several thousand people, uh, it is also cognitively taxing. So to move around and orient your virtual body is an orientation of your physical body. And it, it is taxing cognitively. When I would come out of these events, uh, this one, I was exhausted. I was literally bedridden for two days. It was, there was so much that I had to do to, to keep present, to keep a virtual body present and a, a group of people, as you can see on this screen all around me and the tech working. Uh, it, it, it's hard. This stuff is hard, not easy to get right. So if it's hard and not easy to get right, the, the adoption is going to be low. There are going to be dedicated users, but it's not going to be the tens to hundreds of millions of people who use Facebook or, or Instagram or anything else. It's just not. It's because it's, it's, it's cumbersome. So I'm not sure where, where, Zuckerberg or Facebook are going with it. I, I haven't really seen. It's my lack of connection with all this that I haven't read up on what their their plans are. Maybe I should just watch Zuckerberg on Joe Rogan or something, and then I'll know. But you know, uh, I just don't know. I mean, I don't know what they mean by metaverse. Do they mean an environment like this? Do they mean something beyond the web? You know, beyond Facebook, beyond 2D cell phone interfaces, what do they mean? You know, or is it a is it a overreach? It's a reach from a maybe a dying platform, because Facebook is starting to lose its cachet and its users. You know, maybe it's it's a it's a reach for something, a reju for rejuvenation for some a platform that has maybe seen its time, its best days. That seems plausible to me. I kind of suspect it's like a bid for like a quick hype cycle over, you know, this concept. And I, I don't know if they're ever even going to launch anything, to be honest with you. It seems they've been entirely vague about it so far. And, uh, you know, I would kind of prefer if they didn't launch something personally, just out of like concern over their the ethical side of their business, you know. That's my own point of view on it, though. In a way, uh, these th what you're seeing here is a platform from the innocent, fresh, you know, breath breathless pioneer period of of the internet. I'm changing my avatar around to see what I've got. Special five. Let's see if there's any anything for that. I, I haven't I haven't worn any of these avatars in years. 
That's so crazy. Wizard, there we go. That's that's more me these days. <laughs> As the beard grows in length. You know, you mentioned those breathless uh, internet days uh, back in the 90s, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of the viewers of Preserving Worlds are millennials, you know, they're people that kind of grew up during that time and uh, were very excited about the sort of like quasi-utopian promise of the internet at the time. I'm kind of curious what you think about how things have progressed since then, you know, what promises of the early internet were kept and... Uh, what seemed to fall by the wayside? That's a very good question. What I'm going to do now, because I don't trust technology, I'm going to stop my hand. Okay, yeah, I put a gap in there, audio track five. Okay, we're good. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, the question I was asking was um, thinking about the utopian kind of view of the early internet, the the outlook that uh, the internet's going to change the world. It's going to be this, you know, th just this very infectious sense of optimism. Um, going from then to now, uh, what promises from those days and predictions from those days do you think came true? And what aspects kind of fell by the wayside and didn't kind of come to fruition the way that people thought they might? I think the things that came true were were many. Uh, platforms got faster and more stable. Uh, things like uh, YouTube, like video, real video became possible because we got broadband and PCs and Macs got better at, at doing their jobs, you know, especially with OS X uh, and PCs got more stable. And then the smartphone brought it to our pockets with incredible reliability because we were able to build brand new operating systems that were totally tuned to the network and weren't sort of in the crappy world of all of the earlier operating systems, which were basically thrown together. So we got incredibly high reliability, you know, not just web browsing, but video and streaming and 3D rendering. The, the game cards got ubiquitous chipsets, got reduced to single chips and built into, you know, chipsets with the whole computer. Uh, things just got really better. And then on the back end, you had incredible things. Uh, well, eBay sort of started it like reputation based, high reliability platforms to deliver things. Uh, Amazon coming along and doing that delivered to our doorstep in less than 24 hours, like virtually any product. I mean, it's a miracle. It's a magic machine, you know, uh, was created. You know, the, you know, the future is distinguished by complex technology that seems to be magic, magic. And if that was Arthur C. Clarke or not, but we live in that world. Um, all of that true. And then, of course, what happens is two things enter the space to game it, in a sense, uh, which is people with malicious intent coming into, because humanity is a collection of individuals that have healed and unhealed parts and traumas and conditioning, causes and conditions from birth. So anything, any medium uh, is going to get, uh, is going to reflect the outside world. It's going to reflect what human beings really are uh, and how they express. So we get, you know, not just propaganda, but but malicious intent to manipulate uh, whole populations. And then there's a lack of the loss of trust. You know, as we saw in the uh, in the social dilemma uh, documentary, a loss of trust in the platform and direct. You know, not even human to human, but AI manipulation of individuals for commercial gain, for capturing attention, for the changing of politics and elections to just, you know, kinds of things that were described by George Orwell in 1984. You know, this pervasive propaganda uh, built by a state agency which is now not built by the state, but is built by individuals, all of us creating that environment, but also by companies. So various visions of dystopian sci-fi 
coming true in the platform, as well as in incredible creativity and output. Artists have reaching audiences, of course, getting paid ever less, less and less, as industries are decimated, old industries are decimated, new ones rise. But then you see things like the rise of TikTok, where people flood into a platform that isn't burdened by uh, obvious advertising consumerism, where you know your data and your personal tastes and your click habits are being harvested, and then people don't have trust or good feeling about that. So they go to new platforms like TikTok, where it seems to be just pure expression of all sorts. And so in some sense, just like a company or a religion or even whole countries or societies, they go through stages of growth and optimism and innovation, and then they go stages of corruption, uh, where perhaps the objectives of money and finance and psychopathy, frankly, hand, going hand in hand with finance, come in and kind of grind, extract from companies and extract from users. And they can leave a hollow shell behind. And we've seen that happen with many, many companies over the years. And it happens to platforms. It happens to technologies. They get, they go through these phases and then there's a degradation. There's literally uh, a kind of collapse of those things. And then new things come up in their place. Uh, platforms that promise more openness, more privacy, uh, crypto technologies promise to be good and do no evil. Uh, but then over time, they get game, gamed by large players or by, by players we don't even know. They get, they get influenced by money and power and power centralizes and then they degrade. And so you get these wave after wave of, of things that happen. And I think it's, in, it's inevitable uh, but some of the original ethos of the Internet, which was, you know, the Internet itself was built by visionary engineers all over the world, starting in the 1960s. And there was an ethos of sharing and disclosure and openness. Uh, when I first got on the ARPANET in the mid 1980s, uh, it was there and it's still there. You know, the, the well community of the late 80s into the 90s begat, you know, other phenomena. There were MUDs and MOOs, and then there were the early virtual worlds, and there were there was IRC Internet Relay Chat, there were web pages and blogs, and then personal uh, videos, and there were things like MySpace that begat Facebook, which was about personal expression and sharing and connecting people, which is absolutely tremendous to, to find people that have, you, you know, left your life when you were a kid and you find them again. That's that's an incredible power, it brings in people incredible joy, people who are ill getting support, reaching out. There's, so it's, it's a complete blend of things. And the fact that it's still open, you know, perhaps in China or Russia or other countries where there's an, a distinct effort to control it and keep certain content out, uh, and create a firewall. Um, that's that's one one version of the internet that could have been uh, here as well. It could have been worldwide. It could have been these walled environments, but it wasn't. Uh, so there's still the open ethos. There's still investment dollars available and pouring into these technologies, and no one, uh, in a sense, carries the flag. No one has control of the flag. We may we may think that someone does. You know, we thought maybe Microsoft ha got control of the flag of technology and the personal computer for a while. And before that, IBM had the flag. And maybe Apple had the flag for a while. Uh, but the flag just keeps passing on from user to company to innovator to public intellectual, it just keeps moving. And it doesn't stay with one government. Governments are just way too slow to adapt to this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I'm, I think that things could have gone better 
But the fact that we have an openness and we have disclosure of what's going on largely uh, means that we can correct for our sometimes bad actions and that this platform is for the benefit of, of humanity. And if you look at COVID, you know, if COVID uh, had happened five years ago or 10 years ago, there wouldn't have been reliable things like Zoom like we're doing today. There wouldn't have been many things. And we wouldn't have been able to kind of run our society and our, our economy. Uh, if it had happened 25 years ago, we wouldn't have had the ability to let people know, to let five, six, seven, eight billion people know what was going on worldwide in real time, and that they could they could reach out to friends and family instantaneously. So a global pandemic, uh, we have a new nervous system. We can respond to such things as a global pandemic or future climate change events, which will be obviously more violent and unpredictable and rock our supply chain and our food production in huge ways. But we have this new nervous system that if we don't break it or game it out of existence or out of trust, uh, it will serve humanity for hundreds of years. Uh, we have to watch how much we use it, how much we drain our personal energy into it and our attention. Uh, but it's it's a mesmer, and a mesmer is something that, you know, it fascinates monkeys or apes or any animal that's looking at a flashy, colorful thing. It can elucidate us, but it can also trap us and drain us. And we just have to learn to live with it. And I think of the Internet as like the colorful snake scales on serpents that were living in the rainforest with us as our number one predator for 60 million years from the prosimian era 90 million years ago, the first of prototype of our ancestors of all apes and monkeys uh, had to watch out for these serpents. And one of the reasons we have 3D color spatial vision is because we had to resolve uh, their scale patterns in low light or we'd be snapped down. And that's how we got our ability to see pixels. Now, this is a this is a a conjecture I have about why we're so good at this. So it mesmerizes us like the snake scales, but there's also a biting end. There's also a there's there's a risk to it, but we can evolve, co-evolve with it. So this is sort of like the serpent, the virtual worlds, internet, cyberspace pixels, all this media, uh, but it evolves us at, as at the same time it's an existential risk. Uh, we just have to know that going in, uh, walking into this, this, this world, virtual or otherwise. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you very much. I love that metaphor of the snake. That is, that's great. Um, gosh, all right. So, um, Let's see. Uh, I wanted to kind of ask a few random questions just to kind of fill in stuff that I think we might need in terms of footage and everything um, to connect pieces of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I was curious to hear a little bit more background on the contact consortium on what it was and uh, like how it was funded and what its goal was. Yeah, so the contact consortium grew out of Contact Cultures of the Imagination, which was a earlier, it's still actually active, uh, Contact Cody, it's called, uh, founded in 1982 by Jim Finero and Frank Herbert, the author behind Dune, you know, we, we the science fiction trilogy or quadrilogy Dune. And the question was asked is, if we got contacted by an extraterrestrial intelligence, how would we know it and how would we deal with it? How would we make contact? And so this group met every year for almost 30 years and with anthropologists, planetary scientists, uh, artists, and uh, uh, science fiction writers who would create worlds. Who would, they would come up with worlds that then a contact exercise would happen. It's a fascinating group. 
and I started coming in 1995, forming, proposing that a new world was coming, and it was called virtual worlds on the internet, and it would have something called avatars, which would represent people. And everything could be represented in these worlds, at least visually. Forests, you could become a, a slime mold creature. You could, uh, you could build castles in the sky. You could do contact exercises with alien bots, or something like that. And in a conversation with Larry Niven one night at the contact conference, we talked about what if you took Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell's Ring World, which was a beautiful science fiction series. What if you could take Ring World, which was this world that would ring an entire sun and capture its energy, a constructed megastructure, and you could put that into a 3D world and have fans in there and live in the side of the science fiction. And Larry thought it was fascinating. And he said, what we would like to do is if we could go in mufti, in camouflage, you know, secret and go into ring world where we'd have 100,000 fans and we'd ask them questions about ring world as, as the authors of ring world. So that was sort of a founding vision. And from then we took a core group of people from contact who uh, had great skill sets and we formed the contact consortium in March of 95, and then in May of 95, the first virtual world actually appeared on the internet. We thought it might take several years. And what we had done is written a white paper with drawings saying, what would a virtual world look like? What would its affordances be? How would it be governed and run? What would people look like? How, what would they do? And that white paper is still online, and it sort of presaged what came after that. So we had a forward-looking, brainstorming view of these things. And as they came online, members of those companies joined the consortium as corporate members. Then we had universities join. Then we had lots of users join, forming like special interest groups. And the organization grew. And its funding sources were some individual memberships, largely donations from from companies for the annual conference, which the first one was held in October of 96 in San Francisco, is called Earth to Avatars, saying, hello, you know, Earth to Avatars. And we had a wonderful time. We had John Scully, the founder of uh, the CEO of Apple Computer there. He had, he had just left Apple. And we had John, Mark Pesci, the guy behind virtual reality modeling language, was a brilliant speaker. And many, many others, 500 people showed up. And from that conference, we had finance then to do activities. And I traveled the world. I wrote a book about avatars that came out in 1997 at the 97 conference. And I just was sort of a Johnny Appleseed of avatar virtual worlds, avatar cyberspace for several years and helped spread it. Uh, and People flooded into the environments to do experiments, to help someone die, you know, death communities, to, to preach the gospel. There was a minister who showed up to create the first sort of cyber church. Thousands and thousands of experiences and events. And we did some of them under the auspices of the consortium to give it structure and resources and experience. And the consortium sort of ran its course by about 2004. Uh, and then I morphed it into something different, which is today the Biota Institute, uh, working on the origin of life and the implications for that new science and discoveries. So the consortium was about a seven year nonprofit community organization that was designed to be a catalyst to get this off the ground and running and healthy and with the, the best features we could come up with and the best community and and experiences like Avatars 98 and the subsequent events uh, to really show what these platforms were capable of doing. Perfect. That is everything I could have asked for. Thank you. Um, excellent. Now, uh, 
I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. We've been going for a little while. I feel like we could go for longer, but I also don't want to keep you forever. So I'll try and wrap it up soon, I think, um, if that's all right. So uh, first I should ask, I guess, um, you mentioned that there were other like conference halls that we could see. And in addition to the conference halls, were there other uh, places you wanted to look at? Or was it mainly just the other conference halls? Yeah, let's go uh, to... I think you'll like this. So what we decided to do after Avatars 98 was let's do Avatars 99, which we did. And then we started doing, and it was similar to this, but a beautifully designed hall, very Asian. But in the time we have left, uh, let's go to uh, Avatars 2001. So, so I'm going to teleport over there with my little link, and you guys can join me. Mm -hmm. I got got you in, got you in. Thank you. So what we decided to do is something pretty dramatic. And if you look behind me, mm -hmm. well, there's me on in the camera, and there's highwaymen coming. And you can see this beautiful thing behind us. It's the Stanley Kubrick 2001 Space Station. So oh, we yeah. we said what what we can do. We're not restricted by gravity. I'm going to write to Highwayman Ev 2001. If I click on get the web link up, let's see. If you click on any of these banners, it'll bring up. Yeah, there it is. The banner on the left that says Avatars 2001, a, a cyberspace odyssey. And you can see the logo that was done, done for it. Shows like a an ape, an avatar ape, just throwing the bone. It's just like the Kubrick film. So it's 2001. Let's 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 do this. So we decided if we take a theme from fiction or from a movie, and people understand the space, they understand the dynamics of the space. And so we took them on a journey. So here we are at the Kubrick Space Station. You guys know what happens next, right? you go to the moon. So I'm going to teleport to the moon. Now I'm standing on the moon, and you'll hear the uh, some of the audio from the, from the film come in. Um, what do we click on to get that? Oh, just join me. Okay, sure. So these are now distinct worlds, so they're not in one single 3D model. They're actually in distinct worlds. There we are. And you're in the, the monolith on the moon in the film where the astronauts have, the, 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 the United States has dug up this black monolith that was originally on Earth that, you know, sparked intelligence. Remember that scene in the film? Yeah, and this so, is quite well done. Yeah, so this is this is from the film, and so stuff happened happened to us here, and there's there's some filmography that there was an event here at the monolith. People went to touch the monolith, and stuff happened to them. And now, if I go, I'm going to go to the Discovery. I'll tell Highway when next the Discovery. So we, we reproduced the film for as the next cyber conference. So here I'm now in the discovery, and you can uh, when you guys join, you'll see it. And that's of course the spacecraft that is going to Jupiter. And that's where the famous expression, you know, open the pod bay doors hell. So if I move yeah. if I move toward the pod bay doors, uh, they should open up. Did they open up? So you actually go out and there's a pod. There's hell right there. There's the hell, uh, you know, the hell logo. If I if I shift, hold my shift key down, I'll just go outside. And now I'm outside the Discovery, and I'm at Jupiter. 
and Jupiter is where, do you remember all the monoliths came by their thousands and they crushed Jupiter? This was in actually in 2010, the next movie. So these are all the webcam wall, webcam portals. And there's the, uh, the spacecraft that Dave Bowman uh, tried to rescue astronauts, you know, when the ship was taken over by HAL. That's right. So what we then did, let's see if I go to the last one. Let's see, is that... I think that will stay there. That That was... Yeah, I think that, that that's good enough. I want to take you to one more world, which is the, uh, well, we can go to Hobbiton as well, but Avatar is 2000. So now um, what we decided to do the year before Avatar is 2001 is to build a full space station world. And now I'm in, in it there. You can, you can join me there. And if you click on the the Avatars 2000, uh, let's see. If I if I click on the warper right behind, and I'll go into the conference history. Yeah, here is a. This is Avatar nine Avatars 99's history. If I click to the right. It says, uh, clicked here to read about Avatars 99, and there's this fantastic imagery of what we did was, because it was the turn of the millennium, we did a huge od odometer roll between 1999 and 2000, so that the objects were replaced by, the, the giant number 99 was replaced with 2000. And this is a space station, so you can walk around this curving hallway and there's various models of rockets and things. And people were, were pouring through this thing. And it was a seven-tiered space station. So I'm just trying to figure out how to re re click to see the whole thing. But they're identical toruses with the different activities in them. And of course, the, the webcam wall and the... And if I actually, I can plunge through the station if I do shift and there's a TIE fighter up there, I float up and there's the uh, the Pan Am clicker clipper from 2001. And this is one, there's the Hubble telescope. And so this is one of seven Tauruses which would house the event, the conferences. The same sort of themes, webcam wall. And we blew up the station at the end. So that was the grand finale after the Avi Awards. So same kind of structure, but different settings. That's pretty fun. You got pretty imaginative uh, as you went on. We, we did. And, uh, you know, there's by 2004, we did Ava, Ava Mars, which was on Mars. In 2003, we did Rivendell. Uh, I'm going to click on Hobbiton and go to Rivendell here. That's Av 2002. Let's see, here we are. And this will be good, too, because uh, later Mitchell and I can come on our own to get B-roll footage if needed as well. So that'll be You nice. can't? Right, right. So this is the Hobbiton, and we did something different in Avatars 2002, which was we said, you know, people have been given a free ride. They've been allowed to teleport and warp between different zones and easily move around. In Avatars 2002, you were part of the, see, you're all hobbits there. Yeah. I, I think I'm Galadriel or something. That's right. Uh, and you can see the textures are getting better. You know, this is technology from 2002 versus 98 or 96. So the trees look better and things like that. Um, but that everyone had to walk. So you were instructed to, there's no warpers. You had to walk immense landscapes to try to find your way around. So I'm just going to fly, see how far I can get. 
If I use the control key, I'll go farther, faster. I think that this one, you have to figure, you have to find your way to Mordor or to some location. And there's big mountain ranges and there's, uh, I don't know if they're here or not. I was, last night I was trying to find my way to Rivendell to see if, because you had to literally try to find your way with the ring, with the fellowship. And it might have been, I'll click on the Rivendell link. You can just join me there. Okay, now I'm in Rivendell. And it was really, you know, some of the same designers and new designers every year that would uh, contribute. And, uh, with, there's music in the sites and there were different different activities and stuff. This was kind of the end. I mean, we did Avamars in 2004 because I was part of Mars programs by then. And we built a, a Mars surface world for like a spirit and opportunity world. Uh, and then I was often doing space work with NASA by that point. I figured, you know, it, it was done. Sort of the innovation was, it was about all we could do, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, that actually brings me to a question I'd been meaning to ask, which is, uh, it seems that you're doing a lot of very interesting research these days that um, is not that directly related to our topic of discussion today, but, you know, and we don't need to get super in depth or anything, but I'm kind of curious about, you know, the, the research you're doing these days. Yeah, I mean, the I'm really doing something that I was completely fascinated with when I was 14 or 15 years old, which was how did life begin? You know, how did you get complex things like a, a lily coming from a simple bulb? But then there had to be an original bulb or seed way back billions of years before. Where was that starting point? And I would do these thought experiments where I would see molecules jumbled together trying to make copies of themselves. And I realized, oh, this is kind of like how scientists work, like Albert Einstein did thought experiments where he tried to go into a world uh, which would be the world of light and physics. And I started to go into this world of complexity with molecules self-organizing. And, and then I met, um, I did all this work. I, did, I, I wrote artificial life code to study this. I, I did my PhD in this in doing, trying to figure out how the universe complexifies. I had a friend in the 90s named Terence McKenna and he and I used to talk about how do things become novel, uh, novel things emerge rather. How do how do new things emerge uh, from simpler building blocks? And this is an old question, but I took it up for real in my PhD work. And uh, then I met Dave Deemer, who I was just with today in the laboratory doing we're doing uh, amino acid polymerization um, and doing thin film uh, chromatography and really trying to say, can we crack the code of how life began? And we think it's in hot spring settings, not in the ocean, not at the hydrothermal vents in the ocean, but hydrothermal springs on land. And we started taking our science out to hot springs all over the planet from Yellowstone to Rotorua, New Zealand, and recently to Fly Geyser near a Burning Man's location, ironically and getting the formation of protocells, little compartments made out of fatty acids that can contain polymers like RNA or peptides or DNA that we also can synthesize through wet, dry cycles in hot springs. And we think we might have found the engine of creation, the thing that created all this. And what I'm doing now is trying to drive basic principles from the engine that lifted life into being is that the same engine that drives technology and culture at the lowest level? So I'm working with philosophers who, who study Alfred North Whitehead or working with AI people trying to create artificial general intelligence that maybe the solution of life's origins is a Copernican 
revolution in the making because it's all about the the engine of creation or the wheel of creation turning and and, and it's a general new kind of physics in some ways uh, physics on top of the physics of that that we know that we've characterized so well the physics of combinatorics and probability shaping so that that's what i'm working on these days and in, in some of the early work of the consortium we took we had four conferences as well as the avatars conference we had the conference at the burgess shale in canada where we took a hundred people up to this fossil quarry half a billion years old to see the first animals that were preserved in shale and then with richard dawkins and douglas adams we explored it further in in england in 98 and it just kept going and so that little part of the contact consortium became biota.org, which is now sponsoring science and life's origins. So the contact consortium morphed into biota. And that, that's what I'm working on now. It's like how life began and all the implications uh, from, from that discovery, if indeed we've made, we've made a discovery. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. That is heady stuff. Definitely a fascinating subject. Are you making good progress with it lately? With it lately? Yeah. So our hot spring hypothesis, uh, which you can see in the, it's online, it's available for free. It's in a journal called Astrobiology. And that's gone global and it's created a, a paradigm shift in, in science to where uh, many groups are now working in hot springs through wet dry cycles and it's swept the field and so there's very little attention now going to the ocean origin hypothesis of the last 30 years and it's all gone to these darwin's warm little ponds on land hmm. very interesting um well uh like i said it's uh this one's going long and that's totally okay it's going long because this is a fascinating like conversation, but um, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask if Mitchell, uh, Mitchell, do you have any questions you'd like to add in here? Uh, yeah, I had, I think just one thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess <laughs> one question and then one request. I'm not sure if you had other um, teleports sort of on your list. I've just been sort of logging all of the places that we've gone to so I can return to them later for more footage. But uh, I was curious whether this was already on your radar or not, if you recall any particular uh, amateur worlds, I guess I would say, or amateur made areas in here. Um, we've seen a lot of like... Users. Hmm? Yeah, oh, there's so many. There's hundreds. I'm just looking back at the world list yeah um there's some that are long gone because they were hosted on other people's servers but i'm just seeing if there are any yeah i mean uh gosh how to there's just so there's yeah there's so many um I mean, and it's also not something that we have to like sort out now, but if there are any particular ones that like you remember that you still see around or you still see on the world's list, um, you, you can also, oh. I'm going see. to the Psy Awards. Psy, Psy was the original name of the first avatar. Uh, and I think it's, they're still, they still have a, like awards for the best worlds. Oh, so this is sort of wonderful. still active there. As you can see, there are not that many users in here. Uh, back in sort of the glory days, it would be three to four, two to four hundred people all the time. Uh, but this is this is I know I, I kept getting news for the Psy Awards. So you can see there's sort of better animations and better because they're they're featuring good design. Uh, and I haven't been here in forever, but this kind of looks like a, a watery Burning Man in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like, like the Burning Man Temple. Very cool. 
Wow, this is awesome. Yeah, this looks like it could be a great resource. It's a community-based, this is a community effort here, as are many. You should ask Highwayman. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be definitely something to keep on our list. Yeah, because we're going to try and, you know, include footage um, from, you know, a bunch of different places. Um, so, yeah, some any community worlds that we can at least just write down and explore another time would be great. Um, I had one other sort of question for you specifically, um, which kind of comes back to um, this, I guess, this sort of <laughs> running theme that we've seen in a, a few of our interviews and in some of our other episodes, um, this idea that the medium is the message um, and essentially uh, as it pertains to virtual worlds, the way that like virtual worlds are set up and um, sort of the rules of like what users can do, what they can make or, you know, how they can interact with the world um, shapes so much of like the social functionality of that world, like how different kinds of social interactions can come up. And so I guess with that idea in mind, um, a, whether you, you know, believe that to be true or, or and B, if so, um, I was wondering if you could talk about how you find virtual worlds um, in general can allow for maybe different kinds of social connections than you would find in, um, I guess, meet space. No, early on, that's a very, very good question. Early on, we sort of asked what, what, characterizes the users of these these places and uh, to some extent they were there was a there was a section of the user base that were found would be self-described as socially awkward or socially anxious but in in world they were sort of super organizing beings that that had great social skills that they felt comfortable ex expressing in world that they didn't uh, out there in shopping malls and gas stations and things like this, with a world that they felt was overwhelming. And then there were people that were isolated and sort of locked in, or people who were in jobs that uh, they felt trapped in, and they felt liberated in these worlds. There were also users that were wheelchair bound or, or bound through illness. But then there were users that were just uh, an auto mechanic that felt that this was like an incredibly high tech, creative, delicious way to spend their time beyond what was a fairly routine job for them. And they became an incredible designer. And then there were, you know, the university professors and the students and, and young people that wanted to build and were exploring aspects of themselves. There was a young guy that built something called Sky City in here uh, who learned how to organize other 12 and 13 year olds into a project. They learned project management. Uh, a stu uh, other students actually were all over the world building Sky City and he learned how to manage cultural differences uh, and team organization and team disputes. So we, we watched that that I think I covered in my book avatars like what was learned in Sky City was how to live in the future. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a, a, a good answer, but in user built worlds where you really are controlling your environment, it's not a fed thing. It's not a, an experience designed by somebody else that you go through. Uh, you really are responsible for, you own your own words as Clifford Stoll would say, but you also, it's your pride of point that you make a beautiful space and that it works for people. And huge uh, skill sets, generally useful in life, can emerge from, from such a creative medium. That's why we jumped on this platform, especially early on, because we realized it was really 100% the company because it didn't really commercialize this platform as it was doing with its other platform. It left it to the users to do it. And so, the creative potential and the human impact of this platform was far greater 
then the company platform, uh, which is called World Chat. So it's, it was just a, a testament to what people can do on their own, working together, being creative, self-organizing, you know, Burning Man being an example, but hundreds of other projects now and in the future, you know, as, as big institutions crumble to some degree, even like big science universities, companies as we knew them, government as we knew it crumbles uh, under the weight of change and uh, just just the fact that the world is just too rapid for them to respond to. It's the users coming together that, that create the content, that create the networks, that create the political dialogue, the intellectual achievements, the new products, uh, the solutions. And so virtual worlds were a a proving ground for ordinary people making magnificent things and having experiences with each other. Um, so hi, women down here who's joined us is saying, there are some expo worlds, never been to them. I came so close one year to winning one of these awards, the Psy Award. Uh, so that's an example right there of a user that tried to put their, their thing into the competition Derek's asking, what was your contribution that year? Maybe we'll film it. Maybe we'll film it. So uh, it's great to find an old time user. I don't know how old time he is. There's probably a way to, to figure that out. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's just still to this day from when I first walked into Alpha World in August 31st, 1995, in a state of wonder that I could see other people text chat and click on an object and move it and put something together and leave my mark on it. This, this state of delight and wonder as a cyber colonist that I had is still there. I mean, it, it's, I think it's there for anyone, any new user. Um, so I don't know if that's a long-winded answer to a short question. I thought that was great. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I, I can't think of anything else uh, right now. Um, so yeah, I'll just, you know, echo Derek and <laughs> want to thank you so much for your time. This has been a really, yeah, just like enlightening and just <laughs> wonderful conversation. I, I hope it helps in your, your mission, which is a, a, a wonderful one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, and much. I'd like to echo what Mitchell's saying. Like, this was a fantastic interview and conversation. Uh, we got a lot of very, very interesting thoughts from you and great history. I think this is going to make for an excellent episode. And uh, really, I, I got to thank you for taking, you know, over two hours out of your day for this. Like, this was great.